and thank you all for joining us. This is our third session of the webinar series, Ingredients for Scaling, and I'm very excited to see people starting to join us. Um, so before I pass on to our moderators, um, who will give us like a small introduction of this webinar, I'm going to introduce myself. So my name is Maria Camila Gomez. I am the COP Community of Practice Administrator of the Data Driven Agronomy. Um, I will be behind set making sure that all technical aspects are running correctly. If you're having any trouble with audio or video or need any help in any way, just let me know through our chat box. Um, I do want to ask that if you have any questions during the webinar, um, put them please in the Q&A box. Um, I encourage you to write them directly in the Q&A box and not in the chat box because it's going to be a bit difficult for us to um, manage from both these chat boxes. But um, just please make them sure to write them down in the Q&A box. Um, just to let you know that the link to the recording will be here through our social media channels and the web page of the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture and the YouTube channel. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to our moderators. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Maria Camila. So my name is Lennart Woltering. I work for CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat uh, Research Center in, um, in, in Mexico City. I also chair the ARD, the Agricultural Rural Development Working Group of the Community of Practice on, on Scaling. This is about a group of 150 people, donors, um, researchers, implementers, organizations passionate about scaling and, and the who and the why and the what of scaling, right? And very happy to introduce now this uh, third um, webinar on, on scaling. Uh, we have about 160 people uh, joining up, which is really great. Uh, last month, we had our session on the science of scaling. Two months ago, we had a session on the why and the what of scaling. So if you're interested in that, you can find it on the website. You can look it back. And this one uh, fits nicely with it because this is about the art of scaling. Right, I think few people would disagree that uh, that whatever we say about scaling is right or is, is wrong. Right, the question is how do you really do it? <clears throat> how do you do it in a project? How do you do it as a as a practitioner? How, what are the practicalities of, of really applying the scaling approach? Right, how do you put your money where your mouth is? That's kind of like the question of today. The other thing that we're also gonna dive deep in about is is the role of data within. Uh, within scaling. We have a lot of people from the data communities joining us. So we thought, okay, let's also focus that, uh, put some accent on, the, on that one. So I'm not doing this alone. Fortunately, you saw already Maria Camila, but uh, the, uh, the, the second co-moderator is Daniel. Daniel, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Werner. That was a nice introduction to the topic in this, we in this webinar. So hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Jimenez. I'm the leader of the community of practice on data driven agronomy. So I'm pleased to see you all again attending to this webinar. So just to remind you that this community of practice is part of the CGIR platform on big, the, for big data in agriculture, which works to harness the capabilities of big data to solve agricultural development problems faster, better, and at a greater scale, and feeding the world in the future bite to bite. So one of the main goals of the community of practice is to facilitate and communicate collective action on a particular topic across uh, the CGIR and its partners and that is precisely what we want to do here today in this webinar so bringing virtually colleagues to share their experience on scaling uh, on the, the different projects in different geographies so let's get started and I hand over to Leonard who will introduce our first speaker over to you Leonard. Daniel Daniel thank you Daniel <laughs> I always like the bit by bit piece that you that you say so I have to introduce Johannes Linnert. It's a bit of a challenge because you really have to do cherry picking from his, from his CV. But let me, let me give it a go. So he spent three decades at the World Bank, including as vice president for financial policy, but also of Europe and Central Asia. Director of the Wolfenson Center at Brookings, where he is now non-resident senior fellow. And he served uh, as the chair for the replenishments of IFAD and the Green Climate Fund. He's co-leading the, the scaling community of practice. And if you find this all too much, 
I, it helps me to think of, of Johannes as what Rogers is to the adoption literature and the thinking, Johannes is to the literature and thinking around scaling. So he's really the, I think there's no publication on scaling that doesn't mention his work. So we are very, very honored to have him here and I hand over to him. Um, Johannes, go ahead. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks Leonard and thanks Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes, hear right. you, Johannes. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Sorry to interrupt you, Johannes. Can you all see the my screen? Yes. The PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Johannes. We see it as a we see it as a as, as the presenter view. So it's not a full screen presentation. Okay. We see the next slide. No. Let's see. Sneak peek of the, of the next slide. How about now? Excellent. Perfect. That's Go right great. ahead, Johanna. Sorry for inter to interrupt you. No problem. Thank you very much. I'm always impressed with how technology works. Uh, so thank you again, everybody, for joining this morning, afternoon, evening, maybe. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the practical considerations when we are engaged in efforts to scale up an intervention. Uh, I will talk about three perspectives of looking at the scaling challenge. And I think this is slide one that you have in front of you, giving you a little bit of an outline of what we'll talk about today. So first, how to take a successful innovation to scale. Second, how to ensure that individual projects are not one-off, but support a scaling pathway. Uh, then we'll do a little detour on a practical application on the on how uh, to implement perspective one and two and then turn to how to support system change that allows successful innovations to be scaled. And uh, at the request of uh, our hosts, Leonard and Daniel, I'm ending up with some brief reflections on an evidence and data driven approach to scaling. Uh, I have to say I'm not a big data guru by any means. On the contrary, I tend to actually focus more on qualitative evidence but I'm very happy that I'm part of this exercise because I really want to learn more about the data-driven approach to scaling. So with that as an introduction, let me uh, turn to the first perspective, uh, which is scaling up innovations, innovations along a scaling up pathway. And this indeed the most common approach to scaling is to consider how a successful innovation, for example, a new climate smart agricultural practice, can be scaled up through effective diffusion of production, marketing, and adoption. And this generally involves a sequence of steps, com commonly referred to as the scaling pathway, as I show in the stylized graph uh, in the next slide. Um, Maria, please, next slide, slide two. Uh, on top of the slide, you see a bunch of arrows from left to right, uh, starting with ideation, then research and development, followed by proof of concept. Then we turn to actually the transition to scale and then the actual scaling process. And finally, not to be forgotten, operating at sustainable scale. So these are the sort of commonly distinguishable stages and it's actually quite helpful in thinking about scaling at which stage you are in the process because conditions, constraints, opportunities, uh, instruments for scaling will actually, and the data needs by the way, will change as you move from step to stage one through the various stages to stage six of the scaling pathway. Now, previous work on scaling innovation shows that for successful scaling, it helps not only to have a good understanding of what is the innovation about and whether it works, but also to have a clear vision of uh, scaled up impact that you want to achieve. And this is, uh, if you look at the bottom box of the slide, the slide in front of you, slide two, you see the big circle at the right are linked by, let's call it the scaling up pathway to the actual innovation that you're trying to scale up. So it's very important in, ex in our experience to have a vision of where you want to end up. Now this vision may actually change over time as you move along the, the pathway because you learn more about what is possible as you scale up or what may not be possible as you scale up. But then there's also, and shown in the same box on that slide, the question of what are the enabling factors that support the scaling process and the pathway from innovation to impact at scale. Now, among those factors are what we call drivers that push the scaling process forward and barriers that hinder the scaling process along the pathway. I sometimes also refer to spaces that have to be created 
to allow initiatives to grow. And that comes because, you know, as fiscal economists that I've been in, in my past, we talk about creating fiscal space to allow uh, initiatives to grow. So we can either talk about barriers or we can talk about that hinder scaling process, or we can talk about creating spaces to allow initiatives to grow. Now, the drivers include such aspects as champions for the scaling process. It includes incentives, for example, subsidies, and very importantly, it, it includes creation or existence of market and community demand. Barriers that have to be removed or avoided include fiscal and financial constraints, institutional capacity limitations, policy and regulatory obstacles, environmental constraints, particularly important in agriculture interventions, land or water availability, for example, and also the lack of partners. And I would finally add, it's not shown on the slide, but I would also add political constraints, so we'll come back to that. Now, the drivers and barriers or spaces together represent what I refer to as the ena enabling factors that are highlighted by the red overline in the same slide. And the way enabling factors affect the scaling process will often change as you move from left to right along the scaling pathway. So frequent adjustment actually in how you uh, deal with these uh, enabling, uh, enabling factors will be uh, important along the pathway. Finally, let me mention here that it's clear that monitoring evaluation or M&E plays a key role since it's needed to assess not only whether you have the desired impact uh, and whether it's achieved along the scaling pathway, but also, and very importantly, how the various enabling or impeding factors, drivers and barriers, impact on the scaling process along the way. So this is the first perspective, basically looking uh, at how do we scale up a particular innovation or a particular uh, intervention. Now the second perspective, which I believe is actually very useful as we think about scaling up, and this is focusing on multi-year, multi-project programmatic approaches to scaling up. And uh, this is because most development work is organized in the form of time-bound projects. And all too often development agencies design and implement the projects as one-off activities with insufficient consideration of how project impacts can be sustained and how they can be replicated and scaled up when projects are successful. So a key finding of the scaling up experience is that successful scaling usually will take many years and indeed requires sustained engagement by various actors supporting the process through multiple project cycles. And therefore a one-off project will generally not be enough to sustain the scaling process. Instead, projects should be considered as interventions along a scaling pathway, as we show in the next slide, uh, as a slide that leads scaling up with successive projects. Now, start on the left-hand side of that slide with project number one, a traditional, let's call it one-off project, which, however, when you look then at the pathway, really represents only a first step along a potential scaling pathway. For it to have the ultimate impact on the desired scale, say at national level, it must not only have sustained impact, this is the solid green arrow rather than the red dotted arrow, but must follow up, be followed up seamlessly with subsequent projects or interventions that continue the scaling up process. Successful scaling up through the project therefore requires planning already during the life of a project, say project one, or actually also during the life of project two, for what will happen when the project finishes. It needs to consider, the planning needs to consider what enabling conditions have to be put into place to allow the follow-up project to proceed without a break. This includes very importantly, who will be the actors to take on project two or three, how it will be funded, what are the policy, institutional and political conditions required, and what partnerships need to be mobilized. This multi-project perspective can be referred to as a programmatic approach with a program conceived of as a sequence of projects from the very beginning. Now, let me uh, break uh, my narrative a bit here before going to the third perspective and give you some example of a practical application of the first and second perspective. So the trick in my experience, when you want to apply this approach, these approaches, I should say, or these perspectives is to ask five relatively, and answer five relatively simple questions 
as shown in slide four. Next slide, please. So here you see five questions. Question one, is the project design based on a clear conception of the overall scaling pathway? So at every project should begin actually with a scaling pathway in mind. Is the problem which the project is addressing well specified and is there a vision of scale if the project is successful? The second question is, are the range of interventions under the project clearly identified and is there evidence that they are appropriate, i.e. they are likely to have the expected impact at any particular stage in the scaling cycle process that you're at? Third, have the critical potential enabling factors been appropriately considered and put in place to the extent possible? If certain constraints cannot be altered, for example, policy constraints, lack of financing, institutional weaknesses, political opposition, and so on, then the question is whether the project design has been adjusted to affect these constraints, and indeed, one may decide that scaling isn't possible or appropriate, and therefore abandon the thought of scaling up. Question four, is program sequ sequencing appropriate? In terms of continuity beyond project end, in terms of vertical and horizontal sequencing, in terms of building systematically on the experience of pilots or prototypes, and in terms of a systematic ass assessment of scalability. And finally, question five, does the monitoring evaluation approach include an explicit focus on scaling? Now, I've used this simple set of questions in working with various development institutions uh, and uh, project and program teams, for example, in IFAD, UNDP, African Development Bank, and so on. And I try to assist, uh, to assess with them whether their project design and implementation adequately reflected scaling considerations and what needed to be done to improve the scaling focus. By way of example, take slide number five. Uh, Maria, if we could move to slide number five, which shows a summary analysis for three UNDP supported projects and programs in Moldova including a bioenergy program, which involved a carefully sequenced multi-year, multi-project program in support of biomass energy development for rural communities. As you can see from the color-coded assessment, the biomass project was particularly strong, the blue color. In the overall design areas on top of slide five, the early, the first set of questions, but they had a mixed, it had a mixed record for the enabling conditions since it only partially addressed policy, fiscal, and partnership aspects. And while excellent on continuity of project engagement, it only had a partial use of scalability assessment and only limited consideration of scaling aspects in its M&E uh, approach. So with this uh, approach, we were able to identify areas where the programs were strong, where they were relatively weak, and where improvements could be explored and discussed and put in place. Now, I should say that the practical approach that I'm presented here is only one of many available. And so many more, at, at, and, and some are more elaborate of these approaches than others. Mine is pretty simple. Now, my own, own advice to the practitioner is search for the one the approach that is, fits your program need, but also keep it simple because uh, in my experience, when you get into complicated uh, processes, and approach to analyses, you often tend to get lost and actually lose uh, patience uh, with and go back to your, what you used to do originally. So uh, let me then turn, get back on track and look at our third perspective, uh, which is achieving scaled up impact through system change. And the reason I included this, and you can turn to slide six now, Maria, is that recently a systems approach to scaling up has been advocated by some experts, and I wanted to share with you briefly what it means. A systems approach to scaling typically considers the entire set or a subset of enabling factors that we identified earlier in slide two. And the systems approach asks what changes are needed to provide the appropriate opportunities for a whole universe of potential individual in innovations shown on the left hand side of the slide and actors to help achieve the scale goal of developmental impact, for example, an SDG. Uh, now, as noted earlier, areas for systems change include a whole bunch, basically same as we listed before, fiscal financial policies, institutional development, capacity building, policy and regulatory form, et cetera, and et cetera. At the country level, these system changes generally require action at the level of, region, of national governments, 
they can focus on comprehensive reform changes or specific sectoral and thematic changes, for example, agriculture sector reform. Now, certain funders, for example, the large multilateral development banks like the World Bank can and do support systems change along these lines and uh, do so at the national, subnational, sometimes actually even at the supranational level. In these cases, instead of financing individual innovations or investment projects, they support policy and institutional reform, usually with budget support or development policy financing. It's important to note, uh, however, that when you are aiming for and implementing system change, you'll need to continuously monitor how the reform process that you're supporting and pursuing impacts the individual innovations, interventions and projects as they go through their respective scaling pathways. You need to do this, you need to verify that the system change, changes actually have the intended consequences in terms of supporting scaling up at the project and innovation and intervention level as there can well be unforeseen and unintended consequences that require, require correction in the reform path. So let me now finally turn to the question of scaling and data. So how do we use data, or I would say more generally evidence, to inform the scaling process? Uh, is there probably as many answers to this question as there are projects, programs, sectors, thematic areas, and so on, but let me try and suggest some general ideas related to the framework I presented in slide uh, two and uh, above, uh, and now let's turn to slide seven. So what are the basic elements of a, in my, in my experience, of a uh, uh, data-based, evidence-based approach to scaling? Now, first, I think it's very important to consider evidence on whether the intervention works, of course, as, intended at a, as the intervention is intended at any given, usually small scale or under given circumstances. Now here, the use of randomized control trials or RCTs is preferred, but qualitative evidence may also be needed uh, if you have multiple RCTs in different contexts uh, for the same set of in interventions, that helps since it allows an evidence-based assessment of con contextual factors. Second, is evidence to inform the vision of scale. It helps to know what is the potential market who are the expected adopters or the expected beneficiaries? For example, if you look at smallholder farmers, it's important to know, and you want to support them at a national scale, it's important to know where they live and what are their characteristics. And this can be done predominantly with quantitative data such as surveys. Third, there's evidence on the enabling factors that has to be collected. This will generally involve a combination of quantitative and qualitative data. Take, for example, uh, policies as an enabling factor. Here, uh, very commonly, we'll need quantitative as well as qualitative analysis of policy and regulated constraints uh, or how incentives can be used, such as taxes, subsidies, and so on. If you look at uh, the enabling factor, fiscal and financial uh, policy specifically, now here you want to collect data on costs of interventions and how costs are expected to change along the scaling path. Are they economies or diseconomies of scale and how do costs behave under different conditions? Also, you'll need data on people's and communities' ability and willingness to pay for products and services, private or public. You'll want to have information on the availability of public budget resources from various levels of government. And finally, uh, at least what I want to mention here, finally, information how different financing instruments, grants, loans, guarantees, equity contributions, so on, work at different scaling stages under different conditions. I could go on and give you more examples on institutional enabling factors, partners and funders, environmental enabling factors, and political considerations. Let me just uh, mention briefly environmental factors because they are particularly important for agriculture. Here you'll want quantitative and qualitative analysis of the environmental resources or natural resources uh, uh, that are available or constraints that might, may apply, for example, water, soil quality, and so on. And of course, much of this will involve quantitative analysis. As regards political considerations, I think it's very important, especially as you go from a small to a much larger scale inter uh, intervention goal, to employ quantitative and qualitative analysis of who are the winners and losers from interventions 
along the scaling pathway and how they map in both the equity objective that you may have in mind, but also the political landscape uh, for the intervention that's to be scaled. Now, final word on data uh, uh, here. The uh, evidence, of course, is needed for, uh, and data needed for monitoring evaluation. Uh, you'll need to know uh, whether or not your, and you'll need to monitor and evaluate whether or not your project actually has the desired impact, but you also need to uh, keep track of what is the relevance of your vision and what is the evolving nature of the enabling conditions. In closing, just let me share with you five lessons that I take away from my work on scaling over the past few years that may be relevant for how data are being used. First, make sure you do at least some broad exploratory analysis of the potential scaling pathway as you uh, engage in your intervention and uh, aim to scale it up. And that should include the vision of and all potential enabling factors, uh, drives and spaces, because surprises are possible and likely. You may not have thought that a particular enabling factor is indeed relevant, but as you uh, do the, uh, the scan, you may actually discover that it is, and you will have to want to deep, dip more, dig more deeply. Second, focus your in-depth quantity and quality of analysis on what are the most, the most binding constraints. Third, use evidence scaling analysis. Uh, as you use uh, evidence-based scaling analysis, you will likely require some technical capacities that go beyond the traditional technical area expertise that is involved in the early stages of your innovation process and scaling process. So you may need some capacity on policy, financial, fiscal, environmental, and political analysis uh, with the relevant skills. A fourth lesson is that a combination of large quantitative data uh, of project level RCTs, small quantitative data such as cost and cost benefit analysis, and qualitative analysis for institutional political aspects in particular will likely yield best results. So a combination of approach data and evidence approaches is likely needed. And finally, let me return to a pervasive theme I believe is relevant for the practitioners and the frontline actors Keep it as simple as possible. The key thing I think in the scaling business is to explore the scaling dimension and try to pursue it as far as possible and not to get wrapped up in too many expectations of great detailed analysis because as a practitioner you may find that the effort that is required to go into great depth along many of these dimensions may actually be complex and costly. And given that you have constrained resources in project design and management implementation or evaluation, you may find that uh, using very elaborate and uh, sophisticated tools may actually get in the way of getting, getting a comprehensive effective assessment of your scaling approach. So wherever possible, keep it simple. Thank you very much. And over to you, um, Daniel. Johannes, for such a nice and illustrative presentation. Uh, as always, you know, I keep identifying um, the story of my professional life when you talk or when you emphasize, guys, on how long it takes to succeed on scaling, all the enabling factors. I really appreciate that and, and all the, the, the elements that you brought about the enabling factors for, for scaling. So I think the next presentation from Tim will complement very nicely the presentation that Johannes just shared with us. So I'm going to introduce Tim. Tim is a senior scientist and system agronomist at the CGIR. He works specifically with one of the CGIR centers called International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. And as I said before, he will complement very, very, very nicely the, what Johannes just shared with us with a practical example on, of data-driven geography, geography targeting and scaling efforts in South Asia. So let's hear Tim's story. Uh, over to you, Tom, Tim. Thanks so much. I'm just going to share my screen, which I hope everybody is able to see right now. Um, okay, as I, as I start, the first thing I'd like to say is welcome everybody. And um, I'd like to acknowledge also that this presentation is not just me presenting it, but behind me and supporting this effort is a large number of people and, and a number of team members, um, some of whom are listening in on the call today. 
um, some of whom uh, I was very pleased to see a few familiar names in the participants list as well. Um, one of them is a colleague, Richard Cole, who is one of our scaling gurus. Um, and I'm going to be telling a story that actually he um, helped quite a lot with um, in, in some of the early work that we did. Um, so some of it might sound familiar. But what I want to talk about is some is give you a practical example of of taking the work of what Johannes spoke about and putting that sort of into practice. So we'll look at insights and reflection on how you can use data in agricultural technology scaling. And this, oops, this is this is important because in in the CGIR our our core challenge, and many of you will be on the C, from the CGIR on this call is to develop science for practical development, respond to demand-driven research needs, um, and to make sure that the work we do is delivered beyond a, a, a research paper. Um, we don't get funding, we don't get support to, to do our work in isolation. Instead, our KPIs now are around real-world impact, in addition to scientific impact. And that takes a, a fair amount of time to get comfortable with for many scientists, but what we, we need to look at is how we position our work and how we do our work in such ways that we can make sure that it gets moved into practical use and scale. So an example of, of how to do that is, is sort of demonstrated by this, this very simple diagram where you look on the, the y-axis, you'll see fundamental technology uh, scaling research and development, and if you look on the um, the, on the, the right y-axis, you see adoption by farmers and or firms. And you see that this, there's this U-shape, and this U-shape is basically between where you do basic research and engineering, and then very often after you publish your papers and basic research is done, things fall into what we tend to call a valley of death, so the research sort of stops. But in order to take that research a step further and move it into impact, you have to find a way to sort of bridge this abyss between innovation and research and actual adoption. And it's this messy middle ground that in many ways scientists are not so comfortable with, but is really our core challenge and we have to figure out how to take the work that we do and push it over that line. So I'm going to talk about some of the, the work um, that CIMIT has done with partners such as international development enterprises and many others in Bangladesh around the scaling of agricultural machinery. And when I say agricultural machinery, we have a sort of unique uh, approach to working with agricultural machinery in Bangladesh because we're a smallholder dom dominated, very diverse uh, farming system. We're a population dense country, but our labor wage rates are going up very high and farmers are experiencing a scarcity of labor in rural areas with continuous out migration and the growth of other industries and other jobs as the country develops. Yet at the same time, there's a lot of different types of machines and machinery that CIMIT and our partners have worked on researching over the years, like you see in this picture here with this two wheel tractor, attachable seater, um, that we've researched in many ways over the years, we sort of researched it to death. We have a lot of data and evidence around the performance of machineries, their benefits from an agronomic standpoint and so on. Um, but, but when we started some of our projects on this work, we, we were essentially producing research results and researchers were listening, but others were not. So we had this challenge of trying to figure out how we move the use of machinery into um, the hands of farmers specifically. Um, and the way that we've tried to do that is looking at options for agricultural service provision where a single person will purchase a machine, own and operate that machine, um, and then sell the services of that machine, be it a seeder or a harvester or a different piece of equipment to farmers. Faces. So the service, the service provider gains income, the farmer pays for a service, but they have a cost savings relative to the cost of labor given scarcity, and ideally everyone goes home relatively happy. But when we started this work, um, as I said, we had challenges. Um, researchers typically don't have key performance indicators on how many farmers your, the technologies that you research actually reach or, or what the impact is at scale of your work. We tend to be evaluated by our, our research outputs, but not necessarily by getting our work into practice. In addition, scientists and engineers are not necessarily well-trained to advocate or express our results in practical terms. 
Um, there's often poor integration of research within the CGIR with the, with the private sector, and the private sector can actually be a vehicle for pushing technologies into use um, and investment for scaling. And often we don't do a, a good job advocating um, amongst policymakers and others for particular technologies and the things that we see that come as research outputs that might be promising. To give you an example, though, of how this sort of changed, um, if you look at this column here, you'll see sort of some of the metrics that we would originally have used around um, evaluating agricultural machinery. We would look at it like an engineer. What is its full fuel use efficiency? Is it ergonomic and easy to use in the field? What's its field capacity? How many fields and hectares can I service in a day? What's its technical efficiency discharge rate in the case of pumps, establishment rates, so on and so on. All these things that you can measure with a tape measure um, and put on a clipboard like a scientist. But if you want to understand the impact of a potential technology at, at scale, you have to take a wider lens. And you have to start looking at, well, is if, if you have good data that's scientific, you have, you have some credibility around talking about the particular technology or machine, and then you can perhaps advocate with it. The perceptions of end users are equally important as data. The capacity of end users to invest in technologies, farmers to invest in technologies or service providers to purchase machinery is equally important. The ability to observe a technology for use in practice is also very often a prerequisite to interest to adoption and so on. So we started to move through a process where we went from, on the one hand, doing very fundamental agronomic and engineering oriented research to doing much more holistic evaluations of particular technologies and looking at their characteristics in terms of their potential for scalability. So I want to get a little bit into how data can be used. And I'm going to give you some very, very simple examples that come from very fundamental diffusion of adoption theory. Um, uh, Leonard mentioned Rogers early on, but um, Everett Rogers, Rogers wrote the seminal book, Diffusion of Innovations, way back in uh, uh, 1962. Uh, I believe. And he developed this theory that you see here um, that basically shows a, a, a hump shaped curve that represents the um, frequency of adoption of a particular technology or a particular product or a particular innovation. And it looks like a bell shaped normal curve like many of us see. If you take that bell shaped curve and flip it on a side as a cumulative probability curve, you see what we call this typical S shaped curve that goes up in orange. And what's important is that in, in this sort of theory of diffusion of innovations, you see that once you get past a sort of 20% point, it's often referred to as a tipping point, once you push adoption past that level, very often adoption and use of a technology starts to happen spontaneously, right? So you want to sort of target getting to that level. And after that, the technology or whatever you are working on, your research outcome, should start to move on its own, according to this theory. Now, to show you what that looks like more broadly, um, this is a sort of famous diagram that's been used by quite a lot of people, but this shows you the rates of technology adoption from 19, uh, the 1900s to the early 2000s for a bunch of different technologies. And what you'll see from telephones to electricity, refrigerators, clothes dryers, air conditioning, all the way to the internet, is this repeating S-shaped curve. It's a messy S shape, it's not clean, but you see this pattern happening. And you also see that over time, as we have mass communication technologies, the adoption of innovations tends to happen more quickly. And it happens more quickly because people have the capability through mass communications and ICTs to communicate and tell each other about technologies, which creates awareness around technologies. Another example, and this is very hard to read, um, but I picked it up because I, I really liked it because it came from the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, which is not typically a journal that scientists read, but sometimes has some interesting information. Um, and if you look at it, this is the rate of adoption for in information communication technologies, and you see the same sort of patterns happening again. So you see this sort of trend. Now, what does that mean if we go back to thinking about scaling of agricultural innovations? Well, we started to work in 2012 um, on a project around scaling agricultural machinery, and we developed a, a sort of simple theory whereby which we wanted to 
implement a, a, a number of activities to try to get, in particular geographies, the use of different machineries to a commercial tipping point whereby machines would start being sold by the private sector um, and we could release a lot of our, our own efforts in pushing technologies further. And so we did this by partnering very closely with a number of companies that had a financial interest in seeing um, appropriate machinery move into use by farmers. They wanted to make profits, that was okay with us. We wanted to see farmers benefit, so we started to work together on this approach. And we did this through a number of mechanisms, um, and I should mention this is a, was a USAID Bangladesh funded project called the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia, Mechanization and Irrigation Pro Project. But we did it through targeting of marketing with companies, joint venture agreements with firms, technical support, demand creation events, after sales service work, work to develop uh, spare parts and mechanic services, and all of these things that we felt were important. But our main goal was to try to reach this tipping point where we had enough adoption of particular machines that it would move on its own, and we could then reduce the work that we were doing and particularly focus on a different geography. So what does that look like in practice? Well, Johannes mentioned that you don't have to, you don't have to be, in order to work with big data or data in data-driven scaling, you don't have to be writing code. This is as simple as an Excel spreadsheet that you see here where I put together. And this is work um, that in many ways we learned actually from our colleague with Richard Cole, who was on the call. But this is an approach around trying to understand how you might try to reach that 20% tipping point in a particular district for a particular technology. In this case, we used an example of rice and wheat reaping machinery. And what I've done here is I basically said in a hypothetical district X, you can you would have typically 50,000 hectares of, of summer rice and 23,000 hectares of winter wheat. Um, and then you know what the capacity of the machine is. So you know that for reaping rice, you can probably reap 15 he hectares per season. And for reaping of wheat, you can reap um, around 20 hectares per season, which means the machine can typically be used for around 35 hectares per, per calendar year. And from that, you can start to estimate how many reapers would be needed to service all of the area that would be in rice or wheat in a particular district X. After that, you can then take that and multiply it by 0.2, and you have your 20% tipping point, which is your target in terms of the number of machines that you want to see adopted by service providers or sold, in this case, through the private sector to help see machinery services being moved to farmers. But the, the story is that never that simple. You, you, you always make mistakes, there's always failures, there's always setbacks. So we can account for that in a spreadsheet by saying, well, 35% or whatever number you want to include results in failure. So you include that number, and then that means that you will have setbacks, you have a more conservative target, but you're still trying to aim at reaching a tipping point goal. You then take this information, you can calculate the potential profit margin for a, a company, for example, that you're working with that might be investing in selling these machines. Uh, in our case, we worked with, with power tiller operated seeders, irrigation pumps, and reapers. Um, and then you can also project that as a target of saying, well, by the end of year five of my five year project, I want to reach at least the tipping point in particular district X. So you then plan a pathway by which you're targeting the sales or deployment and adoption of those machines with your partners on a year by year basis. And you have a number to guide you as a goal and a number to reflect on and uh, adapt the project if it's not working because you're not meeting the target or perhaps you're over exceeding it. You can also use that with this kind of approach to calculate the potential value of, of profits for machinery sales to partner companies in this case. And that was particularly important for us because again, a lot of the investments in the project that we ran actually came from the private sector so they could sell the equipment ourselves and we were trying to leverage private sector investment in the development process. So what does that look like in, in practice? Um, well, one, the first thing I can say is you can read about it. Um, also on the call I noticed is my colleague Yelly Van Loon um, from Synet in Mexico who led a nice paper earlier this year where we documented some learning around um, scaling of agricultural machinery work in Mexico, Bangladesh, and in, um, 
East and Southern Africa. Um, but what you see here on this graph is a graph that sort of shows you a movement towards this slow beginning of an adoption curve in Bangladesh as we went through this process. And what I want to point out is it's not just about calculating the number of, of hectares that are being, um, that machinery is being used on or the cumulative number of farmers that are adopting machinery. But if you look on the bottom, there's actually a process by which you're also working on the soft systems work that is required to make this all function. And this is what Johannes referred to as the enabling environment and the partnerships that are necessary and working through those partnerships that you see um, sort of described a little bit on the bottom um, in order to stimulate the development process and the scaling process. So how did we, what, what, what did we achieve with all of this work? Well, for the three machines that we were working with, if you look geographically at how we started, um, and this is the, the south of Bangladesh that you see in, in this map, my colleague Sayed put these maps together. Um, and this is part of our monitoring and evaluation strategy, which is also very important, is having geographical outputs and maps so you understand where you're working and what your impact is on an annual basis. But you see these, these, this starting point when we went in our first year of project activities and using these approaches, combining the data-driven technology targeting approach, using that to encourage private sector partners, and also working on the enabling environment and, and, and the soft systems work, and also making a lot of mistakes and having a lot of failures and a lot of debates amongst our own team, we were able to achieve this in the end which is a dramatic um, expansion and a scaling of the use of these machineries. So by the end of this project in particular, working on this entire system, we developed more than 3,000 machinery service providers who were serving more than three, 300,000 farmers at scale. That's what we want um, on, on approximately 135,000 hectares. We also assisted a large number of mechanics and machinery dealers, sparse parts shops and private uh, and, and small companies to develop the expansion of appropriate um, machinery for smallholder farmers in Southern Bangladesh. And importantly, working with those companies because we were able to tell them what we thought they might be able to achieve in terms of profits in different areas, we actually were able to leverage private sector investment in the development process um, to the tune of, of nearly $7 million over a six year period of this project. So that's what you can do with these, with these approaches. But again, it doesn't happen cleanly, it's not easy, and, and it's, it's, it, it requires a lot of partnerships and effort and, and dedication to get there. Um, I saw some of our colleagues from the are also on, on the call, so I, th I threw in one slide also, because we do similar work also in Nepal. Um, and here you see a, a similar beginning of this S curve through uh, adoption work that's been done on the, on the sales of, of reapers as well, um, which has grown in Nepal. In, in Nepal, we also work with a variety of different kinds of machinery using similar approaches to, to what I described here. Now, the last thing I'll say is that Johannes talked about the importance of looking at scaling as a program. And that means embedding multiple product projects in a sequence so you're addressing multiple issues um, along a pathway towards achieving a, a vision. And in this case, our vision was to improve smallholder access to agricultural machinery at an, an affordable rate, um, and ideally machinery that had environment, positive environmental outcomes as well through its use. And we sort of started to achieve that in our first project and then we were lucky to be awarded a second project that now focuses on a, an, another opportunity that opened up um, which is the um, industrial development of domestic manufacturing of machinery and spare parts so after that initial work to, to demonstrate that you could grow the machinery um, value chain and grow scaling as i showed um, the door opened up for uh, looking at domestic manufacturing. And that's one thing I neglected to say, which is that most of the machineries that we worked on previously were imported machines from other countries that were then sold by our private sector partners uh, and then and moved to use with farmers. And the, the excitement and the growth of that sector basically opened up the opportunity to focus on domestic manufacturing. And so we've begun a new project that is, that is focused on, on doing just that, 
first looking at spare parts and small equipment, and then over time we'll grow up to larger equipment. But it's a new different kind of challenge in addressing these issues with the ultimate goal of, again, making sure that appropriate machinery can seamlessly make its way to, the, to, to use by smallholder farmers. So I'll end there, and um, I'm sure there might be some questions, but I want to thank everybody again for the opportunity to give both myself and Johannes some time to speak this evening. Thanks. Thank you so much, Timothy, really exciting presentation. A lot of comments are flowing in, but I'll, I'll direct the first question to, to Johannes. And um, that is about the sequencing of, of projects, the slide that you had with the arrows that, that basically sequence after each other. That's often not favored by the funders, right? Uh, do you see any examples of positive changes that, that, that basically the funders are changing that, that they allow this to happen or, or, or create the conditions for that to happen? And how can advocacy contribute to that? Well, and then there was a, a question B was, okay, what are actually the, the bureaucratic hurdles for, for these um, funding organizations to change that? Right. Well, um, let me say, first of all, the answer, short answer is yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that uh, funders actually are moving towards, uh, rather gingerly towards programmatic approaches, meaning that they have longer term time horizons than the usual three to five year project horizon that most funders tend to have, some actually much shorter, one or two years only. Uh, the Swiss, for example, have, uh, I think three or four years ago, put in place a 10 year pro program horizon that they committed to fund up front in particular on particular projects and programs. Uh, the World Bank has uh, programmatic uh, lending uh, instruments as do some of the other uh, multilateral development banks. So this is not entirely unknown. And indeed, uh, one has a bit of a track record to look at. My own experience with these, however, is that they are number one, they're not actually much preferred by the governing bodies of the institutions, meaning the boards of directors, or for that matter, the political uh, powers in, uh, for bilateral, bilateral donors because they don't like to either uh, lock themselves down into a particular approach or a particular uh, uh, sequencing and, and long-term commitment, or uh, you, uh, you have uh, a situation where uh, there's a sense that, well, you know, uh, there is, uh, by committing ourselves, we actually give away in a sense the store and we don't uh, provide incentives to the local governments, the national governments and whoever is our recipient to uh, effectively uh, move forward. I personally think that's unfortunate and mistaken, but that's the reality and indeed are some of the bureaucratic and institutional uh, hurdles and one can pursue that further. Uh, my Actually, my own experience is that rather than focusing, however, on explicitly and only on sort of programmatic approaches by individual donors or by individual uh, funding agencies. It's actually useful to think uh, instead uh, or in addition uh, about uh, these sequence of projects actually moving from one principal actor to another, from one principal fo uh, funder to another. Uh, let me give you an example of IFAD. I've uh, worked a lot with IFAD in different contexts, including on scaling. And I've always believed and to some extent been able, I think, to convince IFAD management that IFAD's role is sort of in the middle of, the, of this, this project sequencing. IFAD is, as a relatively small, relatively speaking, small international financing institutions in the agricultural space, is actually extremely well placed, I believe, in picking up successful interventions that have been tried by smaller bilateral donors or by the NGO community or by governments, pick those up, take them to the next sta stage, and then hand them off to either the governments or the private sector or other bigger donors, uh, such as the World Bank, who have more money, more capacity, and so on to, to uh, take it to the, next, uh, to the next scale. Now, there are actually some very uh, good examples for that. Uh, IFAD actually played that role very effectively in an Indian uh, project for some of, the, uh, some of the conflicted regions in the uh, far east of the country, uh, where it picked up on, uh, in conflict-affected uh, states of, of India, uh, picked up on uh, NGO-funded approaches to, uh, to dealing with rural uh, communities in conflict zones, developed a very, uh, built on the approach of the NGOs, developed a very uh, good approach in itself uh, on the building on the prior uh, experience. Uh, 
and then handed it off to the World Bank who supported the, a follow-up stage at a much larger scale. So that's actually, in my view, is the way to think about sort of the programmatic perspective on scaling through projects uh, and through uh, sequence, multi-sequence projects. Uh, because in my experience, the programmatic approach for individual agencies, number one, may not be uh, well suited for the actual problem at hand. And secondly, uh, the uh, obstacles that Richard referred to, uh, bureaucratic obstacles tend to be quite significant. Thank you. Good. So I have, we have many questions, but I, we only have like uh, four minutes left. So uh, I picked just uh, two questions for, for Tim, and uh, I'm sure that he will manage that very quickly. So the first question is, uh, do you think, given the scale you have achieved, that the growth, the growth of machinery production and sales is now sustainable and self-generating? And the second one, in addition to the numerical achieving the tipping point in, in, in terms of numbers of adopters, how did you measure whether you will reach a tipping point? in what Johannes called enabling conditions. In your case, will be number of agricultural machinery producers, they willingness to invest, the investment and coverage of their sales force. Over to you, uh, Tim. Thanks, those are really useful questions. Um, on the first one, I, I do believe that we've, re we've reached sustainability for some machines where we essentially don't do any work and sales of those machines are continuing to self-propel themselves. Um, we didn't achieve it for all of ev for everything we tried. Um, the ones that they worked well for were the ones that the example I gave on the reapers. That's quite well self-sustaining now. Um, interestingly, though, the, those reapers, which are self-propelled machines, are are now starting to be replaced by um, by small combine harvesters that are starting to enter the market as well, which is an interesting development. Um, the, the, the small cedars with the photograph I showed you, um, those are used for a variety of purposes and that's quite well self-sustaining. We don't really do any work on that anymore and sales do continue um, and it's entirely led by the private sector. In Nepal, the sales of mini tillers, which is something that we introduced for that are appropriate for the hill environments uh, where there's land terracing, um, that's entirely self-sustaining at this point in time. Um, but some of our work on irrigation pumps and other things didn't work out for a variety of reasons and we push a little bit on them. But at times we also know that it, it might be worthwhile to, to abandon some of the technologies, even if they're a favorite technology, and focus on the winners rather than, than the losers. It's a hard lesson, but it does happen. I love the question in terms of how you measure reaching a tipping point um, beyond the number of adopters. It's, it's, that's really important. Um, I focused on that in this presentation because we're in the big data community of practice, so there was an interest around data, and we often think of data in quantitative terms. But the question's really appropriate because qualitative data is just as important and appropriate. Um, so we, we saw evidence that happened during the project cycle um, of, of things that would reflect well upon an enabling environment being developed for scaling. When you see, for example, companies coming in to um, entering the, the market, new companies wanting to invest in agricultural machinery that you're working on, um, companies that come in and, or dealers that come in for machinery that are unknown to others. Um, and so it hap when something happens and, you, and it happens behind your back and you didn't know it was happening, but some, somehow it was self-propelled by the efforts that you're working on are, is, is sort of a clear evidence that you are, you're seeing that kind of work. And sometimes people call that a crowding in effect. Um, but when you really know that you're achieving something, again, when, when um, you have somebody copycatting what you're doing, for example, outside of your own project's work. And that's really uh, an achievement, actually, when that, when that occurs. That's what you want to see. And we did start to see that for R&D on particular equipment and sales of new and different kinds of, of machineries that started to come in, like, for example, the, the growth of the combine harvester, um, very small, flexible, lightweight combine harvesters that are coming in into Bangladesh at this point in time. So those are some examples. So key message on, on that, just to wrap up, is pay attention to the qualitative data and your monitoring and evaluation just as strongly as you pay attention to your quantitative data and any of the targeting work and the quantitative m and &E that you might be doing. Good. So um, 
Johannes and Tim, I thank you, thank you very much. I mean, thank, thank, thanks for both of you. I think we've been we've been lucky enough to listen to Johannes and all his experience of over the time on scaling and uh, identifying that and, and enabling both drivers and, and, and barriers of scaling and bringing these new possibilities that big data can bring. I really appreciate from both of you that you, you made an effort to bring this data, right? And, and how to explore not only qualitative data, but quantitative data, how can be useful in order to, to, to for, for, for us, for research and development, uh, researchers and take into account in our projects. So, um, in order to close the session, I, we want to keep moving forward this topic, working together with Leonard and the Agriculture and Rural Development uh, Working Group on the International Cup on Scaling that uh, he, he works. So in order to, to move forward this, I mean, it doesn't, end, it, it doesn't end with this webinar. There's still one left webinar from our series, as, as Leonard said in, uh, in the beginning of, of the webinar. We'll be very happy to keep facilitating the development of this topic. Actually, as it has generated such interest by the community as part of the Big Data Platform Convention, we have uh, uh, the Big Data Platform has a convention on a yearly basis. So this year we're going virtual due to COVID, and we will have we will have a session on October 21st called Big Data to Scale Big: A Reality Check. So we will promote it to our social media with our comms people, and there's was and, and there's still one webinar uh, left that is going to be to be held uh, in November. So Leonard, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Not much to add. Thank you so much, Johannes and Tim, and also to uh, Maria, Camilla, and Daniel for for making this um, possible. I think it was a great session. Everybody who sent their questions, we were asking you to put it in the Q&A because then we can answer them um, in a more structured way. But everybody will get their uh, response from um, either one of the presenters on their questions. So this is not, not a, a one-off thing. So thank you so much. We're looking forward to the next one and looking forward for people to say, hey, uh, Tim, I'm interested in it. Let's work together. Or Johannes, can you share some more? Uh, so let's see this as a kind of like a amuse girl, as the French say to get the, the flavors going, right? Okay, thank you so much. See you next time. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.